Allô, Josué. Oh, bonjour, est-ce que tu me reçois? Josué, est-ce que tu me reçois? Oui, Romane, je te reçois très bien. Sur le canal portugais. Très bien. Très bien, mais il y a un fort écho. Il y a un fort écho. Nous allons... Dear colleagues, dear colleagues, sorry for the noise. Dear colleagues uh, in the Portuguese channel, can you, can you, can we take your song, please? You know? Yes, we can hear you here and we can hear you here and now. Reçois bienvenue. Euh... Léonore, Léonore, Isabelle, can we hear from your pays? Yes, I can hear you. Here and now, here and now. Now, here and now. now uh, Josué, on bascule sur le canal espagnol. Dear colleague, dear colleagues from the, the Spanish book, can you, can you say a few words, please? I, I can hear you loud and clear. Josué, can you confirm that you can hear I, I confirm that I can hear like here and now. Not this channel. Wait. Uh, Negro? Negro? Um, on, on bascule sur le canal français. Yes, we're going to fix your language combination. Can you confirm? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, we, we're going to fix that, that, Carolina. Thank you. So, dear, dear colleagues um, in the French channel, can you say a few words, please? Bonjour. Oui, sur Zoom, je vous reçois 5 sur 5. L'enjeu, euh, c'est que les collègues dans la salle vous entendent également. Est-ce que, est que Josué confirme Je confirme, mon ami. Je confirme, mon ami. Merci. Alors, on, on, oui, let's move to the, to the Russian channel. Dear colleagues on the Russian chat channel, can you say a few with Ericsson? Elena Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you loud and clear. Great. Thank you. I think it's all good. I think it's all good. Yes. If, if it works on the Russian channel, it will do on, on the English one. Romanic please for the Arabic. Alors, Josué, est-ce que tu as bien reçu? les collègues sur le canal russe. Cher Josué. Allô Josué, nous ne te recevons plus. Est-ce que tu es, est-ce que tu es, est-ce que tu nous entends?
some of us pretend we understand the difference between PCR and antigen test. lesson of all by far by far majority of the people who have been most severely affected those who have had to be admitted in hospitals and sadly many of those who have died have been people with pre-existing conditions people with so-called comorbidities these are the people with non-communicable diseases. Sorry, I'm talking as if COVID is over. <laughs> it is not over. But the paradox of COVID has been that even though COVID is a communicable disease, the people who have suffered most have been people with non-communicable diseases. And this has reinforced our desire to do something about non-communicable diseases. Fortunately, we are not starting from scratch. The last 10 to 15 years, we've made considerable progress, especially in the area of advocacy. There's been a number of political declarations, World Health Assembly resolutions, and now we are happy that every country in the world has an NDC policy. That is the good news. We are beginning to see an epidemic of partnerships, initiatives, projects, and programs. But the sad news is that the big picture remains the same and even threatens to get worse. The big picture is that NCD remain under-recognized, under-prioritized, under-reported, and underfunded. We are also learning that the non-communicable diseases are clever than the communicable diseases. They kill quietly and silently, and in the process, they destroy every segment of society. That is why our response must also be an all society response. We must mobilize the whole community. And who are best at mobilizing communities? They are our leaders, political leaders, traditional leaders, religious leaders, business leaders, opinion leaders, and the movers and shakers of society. It is becoming more and more evident to us that the key to NCD prevention and control is leadership, leadership, leadership. We are lucky. We have a number of enlightened leaders, but we don't have, unfortunately, the critical mass. What we need is a global, movement of leaders. This is what motivated the three leaders, the Prime Minister of Norway, the President of Ghana, and the Director General of the World Health Organization to establish this initiative to create a global movement of leaders. Our meeting today is a practical manifestation of that initiative. At this meeting, we are hoping that we will hear from an impressive list of leaders. They will share with us their experiences, their insights, and their concerns. But they will also share with us and showcase what they've been doing and provide us with some advice and words of wisdom on how we can move this agenda forward. At the end of the meeting, they will launch a global compact, which in a sense is their vision of how they want to see the world in the next eight years. They will also formalize the NCD presidential group that will oversee 
this initiative. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, today promises to be an exciting day. And once again, we are really grateful that you've agreed to be part of this historic event. Muchas gracias, Melcy Shukran. Now that I've impressed you that I speak many languages, permit me to now invite my colleague Angela, who will introduce our chairperson for today's event and help in the moderation. Thank you very much, Angela. All right, thank you so much, um, Dr. Asamwaba, for your very interesting opening remarks, setting the tone for the ceremony this morning. And I would like to join Dr. Asamwaba to welcome your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, to this historic event, um, the first ever International Strategic Dialogue on NCDs and SDGs, taking place at the Kempinski Hotel Gold Coast here in Accra, the vibrant city of Accra, Ghana, in the western part of Africa. So you're once more welcome to this event. Um, so I'd like to continue. My name is Dr. Angela Akon. I work as a technical officer overseeing essential medicines and health technologies at the World Health Organization country office. And I'm here today um, also because um, I work in the area of cross-cutting activities with the ongoing NCDs projects. And I, together with Dr. Samwaba, will be um, steering the affairs of this program this morning. So next on our program, I would like, and I have the privilege to introduce to us all, the one who will actually be sitting in the chair to coordinate affairs and steer affairs this morning. And this is a great personality who is the king of Orenchi traditional area and the president of the Orenchi Traditional Council, Asin Kushia, in the central region of Ghana. He's a barrister at law and solicitor of the Supreme Court of Ghana. He's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Administrators and Management Consultants, Ghana. He's also the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Chartered Institute of Administrators and Management Consultants, Ghana. If, if you find him in the mining space as chairman of the Perseus Mining Ghana Limited, you also find him in the space in the building, construction, and real estate space as chairman of um, Gassam Foundation and board member of the Gassam Ghana Limited, as well as chairman of Mobile's Property Development. You also find him in the education space as chairman of the University of Cape Coast Sam Jonah Endowment Fund. And he's here today also because we find him in the health space as chairman of the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital. He is also the national TB ambassador as well as a national sanitation ambassador for Ghana. Sanitation because I implore all of us to visit his traditional area where he oversees as kin and it's one of the neatest and cleanest towns you'd find in Ghana. Our chairman for today is the former board chairman of the Tema Development Corporation, as well as the former member of the Council of State. He was awarded an honorary doctorate degree from the Ternopil State Economic University in Ukraine. 
and was adjudged traditional ruler of the year 2017 and 2021. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I have the singular honor to introduce to you all our chairman for today in the person of Ehunabo Brim Pra, Ajin Sem the sixth. Shall we receive our chairman? You did this so well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning. Hey, good morning. Uh, is that the kind of reception I'm going to receive this morning? I have a formula for speaking in public. If you don't clap for me, I won't stop speaking. If you clap for me, I will make it as short as possible. So you better wake up. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, over the past 10 years, I believe 150 million people have died from non-communicable disease. In the next two, 10 years, another 150 million people will perish if we don't take action and immediate action. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, realizing that the non-communicable disease remains the largest, most internationally underfunded public health issue, the government of Norway through the WHO and O. RAD initiative has committed to contribute funding to the WHO, WHO, to support the reduction of the burden of the non-communicable disease in low-income countries from 2020 to 2024. Thank you, Norway. Recognizing Ghana's show of commitment in the implementation of the overall sustainable development goals, Agenda 2030, and with the appointment of His Excellency Nana Adudankwa Ekufuadu to serve as the co chairman of the United Nations Secretary General Sustainable Development Advocates, it was agreed that the President of Ghana, together with the government of Norway and WHO, will co-organize an international strategic dialogue on non-communicable disease and sustainable development goals. This international strategic dialogue starts today. And I have been invited to chair this prestigious international event, which seeks to bring together national and international stakeholders to exchange knowledge and ideas towards reducing the burden of the non communicable diseases in low-income countries, including Ghana, from 2020 to 2024. I accept with humility this call to national duty and to thank the organizers, especially the Honorable Kwekua Jemamenu, Member of Parliament and Minister for Health, for this great honor done to me. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for listening. Did work. Thank you, Nana. 
we're now going to start listening to our leaders. And we're going to start with a group of leaders, very influential leaders, the first ladies. Sometimes calling them first ladies does not do justice to them because they are usually professionals and activists in their own right. And in most cases, they are even more popular and more beautiful than the, than the presidents. We have a long list of head of state, so my colleague will take them one at a time. All right, thank you, uh, my co-MC. So as you said, we are privileged to have statements from a number of countries to be delivered by the first ladies or their representatives. And we know that leadership plays a pivotal role in the success of any endeavor. So many world leaders have shown great commitment as we can see in the room today to ensuring the prevention and control of NCDs. And that has been indicated to you already today. We are privileged to have the first lady starting with the first lady of Bahamas. We shall be receiving her recorded statements. And she's in the person of Her Excellency, Mrs. Anne Marie Davis. Please let's receive her statement. The Bahamas is 100% on board with the substantive achievement of Sustainable Development Goals 3.4 and 3.8, both of which are very relevant to the challenges faced regionally and within our borders. In many ways, our local effort to expand access to healthcare and eventually bring universal healthcare to our people is a key solution to the many non-communicable diseases plaguing our population at rates far higher than the global averages. Cancer, high blood pressure, heart disease, and diabetes are among the most common causes of premature mortality in the Bahamas. Through investments in preventative health care and expanded access to free health care and medication, we intend to get our country back on track to make real progress towards these goals. While our resources may currently be limited, our will to make national health insurance a reality for all citizens is not. This includes expanding mental health services, a critical area that has historically been overlooked and is very much needed considering the impact of the global pandemic recent hurricanes and crime. In its blueprint for change, the Bahamian government committed to rolling out major changes to local health care throughout the course of the next four and a half years. We are still facing similar challenges and we are far more likely to solve them when we work together. Every moment that we are delayed in bringing these transformational changes to our populations is another moment too late to save lives. Let's continue to dialogue, learn from one another, and collaborate as we strive towards creating a healthier, more sustainable world. Right. Thank you, Your Excellency, Mrs. Anne-Marie Davis, for your statement. Now, we we'll would take a statement from the First Lady of Belize, Her Excellency, Mrs. Rosanna Brie Keno. Greetings from Belize. My name is Rosanna Brisenio, spouse of the Prime Minister of Belize and chair of the Spouses of CARICOM Leaders Action Network, ESCLAN. Since its launch in September 2017, 
Esclan has focused on tackling issues related to improving the health and well-being of women and children in our region. There is no denying that the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted lives globally, causing significant hardships, especially for our vulnerable populations. With the onset of the virus, we have seen increased rates of adolescent pregnancy, gender-based violence, mental health issues, and basic health services interrupted. As such, it is crucial for us to increase our efforts more than ever to reverse this trend so that we can make strides toward fulfilling the 2030 SDG agenda. For women in our region, breast and cervical cancers are the leading causes of cancer deaths, while prostate and lung cancers are the most common causes of cancer deaths among men. We advocate for early screening, detection, and treatment. In the case of cervical cancer, a preventable cancer, breakthroughs in science have provided us with a vaccine against the human papilloma virus, and we encourage you to access it as a preventative measure. We urge citizens to adopt healthy lifestyles and have regular physical examinations because we know that early detection does save lives. As a member of ESCLAN, we look forward to furthering partnerships to scale up and expand our efforts to improve capacity, not only to treat cancer, but also to prevent it. Only by working together will we succeed in advancing our collective mission of improving the lives of those living with cancer in Belize, the region and around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Indeed, only by working together can we successfully control and manage NCDs. Now I would like to take the next recorded statement from the First Lady of Croatia in the person of Her Excellency, Mrs. Sanja Music Milanovic. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure and honor for me to address you today. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Sanja Music Milanovic, a medical doctor, epidemiologist, scientist, university professor, and wife of the president of the Republic of Croatia. I'm also very honored to be an expert member of WHO Regional Director for Europe's Advisory Council on Innovation for Non-Communicable Diseases. As a scientist, I have devoted many years to exploring determinants of childhood obesity. And as a professional, I have used that knowledge to initiate and implement the National Health Promotion Program Healthy Living in Croatia. Well, our aim was to create healthier environments in local communities that are equally accessible to all members of the community. For instance, since, since many schools in Croatia don't have a sport gym, as one of our many activities, we created the polygons for physical activity of school-aged children, a special set of equipment that we distributed to more than 1,000 schools in Croatia without a sport gym. This intervention was recognized by European Commission as a best practice to help reach the sustainable development goals. I think it is a good example that shows how, when we all work together, scientists, health professionals, teachers, government bodies, and European institutions, we can make a true impact. This is why, as part of Advisory Council, we are setting up a network of first ladies and first gentlemen to advocate for actions that can prevent and tackle non-communicable diseases, specifically the rising problem of childhood obesity. I hope that through this forum, we will have many different opportunities to tackle this global challenge together. At the end, I would like to quote the great professor Andrea Stamper, 
a distinguished social medicine scholar from Croatia, who was one of the confounders of WHO, and he was the first director of General Assembly of World Health Organization. He said, the question of public health and its improvement must not be monopolized by medical authorities, but has to be cared for by everybody. For only by joint work we can the progress of health be obtained. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you also for your statement, Your Excellency. I had health promotion there, and it's been part of our discussions. So now I would like to take a statement from the First Lady of Niger. Um, this statement will be given in French. So you, I think you make use of your devices. For those of us who are not too fluent in French like myself, and to deliver the statement, shall we receive Her Excellency Premier Dame Hajia Hadiza Bazoum? Monsieur le Président et co-président de la Conférence internationale d'Accra contre les maladies non transmissibles. Excellences, Mesdames les Premières Dames, Mesdames et Messieurs, à vos rangs, grades et titres respectifs. Je suis à la fois ravie et honorée de prendre la parole à l'occasion de la tenue de cette conférence internationale d'Accra consacrée au renforcement des actions et des moyens pour lutter plus efficacement contre les maladies non transmissibles. Je profite de cette opportunité pour adresser mes vives félicitations au président, co-président et l'ensemble des participants pour l'initiative et la tenue de cette importante conférence. Mesdames et Messieurs, la lutte contre les maladies non transmissibles en général, le cancer en particulier, figure parmi les priorités du programme de son Excellence Mohamed Bazou, président de la République et de son gouvernement, qui ne ménage aucun effort pour apporter une réponse appropriée à ces fléaux du 21e siècle. Cette volonté est concrétisé par le renforcement de l'architecture institutionnelle, programmatique, managériale et partenariale visant l'atteinte des ODD, notamment l'objectif 3, qui est de permettre à tous de vivre en bonne santé et promouvoir le bien-être de tous à tout âge. Comme action spécifique déjà entreprise, nous pouvons citer entre autres la mise en place du Programme national de lutte contre les maladies non transmissibles, du Centre national de lutte contre le cancer avec disponibilité de services de chimiothérapie et de radiothérapie, du Centre national de référence de la drépanocytose, l'adoption de la politique de la couverture sanitaire universelle, l'intégration progressive de la lutte contre les maladies non transmissibles aux soins de santé primaires, la mise en place d'un comité national multisectoriel de lutte contre les maladies non transmissibles et d'un cadre de partenariat avec plusieurs ONG et associations. Mesdames et Messieurs, en dépit de l'importance de ces efforts déjà consentis, les niveaux actuels de la morbidité et de la mortalité liés aux maladies non transmissibles demeurent élevés dans notre pays comme dans les autres pays à revenus faibles. C'est pour cela que j'ai saisi cette opportunité pour lancer un vibrant appel aux autorités politiques, administratives et coutumières, à la société civile, aux ONG et médias, aux prestataires de services, aux communautés bénéficiaires, aux partenaires au développement pour une plus forte mobilisation afin de stopper la progression des maladies non transmissibles. J'invite tout particulièrement les pouvoirs politiques et partenaires techniques et financiers, notamment du système des Nations Unies, pour investir davantage des ressources contre les maladies non transmissibles. Pour ma part, je me rendrai entièrement disponible pour œuvrer dans ce sens au sein de la Fondation Nous, que j'ai initiée pour le bien-être de la population nigérienne. Je vous remercie. 
All right, so shall we do it once more for the First Ladies of Bahamas, Belize, Croatia, and Niger. Right, so we also have the regional directors of WHO, as well as the WHO Global Ambassador for NCDs, Mayor Bloomberg, who will be providing their statements through recorded videos. And we'll take their statements now, starting with the regional director for the African region of WHO, in the person of Dr. Machidiso Moeti. Shall we take a statement, please? Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. With just eight years to go to meet the SDG3 target of reducing premature deaths from non-communicable diseases, which we commonly call NCDs, this meeting could not be more timely. NCDs represent a growing proportion of Africa's disease burden, and together with communicable diseases and malnutrition, constitute a triple burden. In the African region, NCDs are set to overtake communicable diseases and maternal, neonatal, and nutritional conditions combined to become the leading cause of death by 2030. COVID-19, with obesity, hypertension, and heart disease as risk factors for severe disease and death, has highlighted the depth of the challenge and the need for a strong multisectoral response. The WHO Best Buys, a menu of policies and interventions for tackling major NCDs, provides a roadmap for action to deliver measurable results. It is heartening that 86% of our countries have incorporated NCDs into their national health plans. The regional office has supported all 47 member states to collect NCD data through our recommended surveillance framework. Cameroon, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa and Togo now have robust tobacco control policies. South Africa taxes sugar-sweetened beverages, while Ethiopia has raised taxes on alcohol. Our host country, Ghana, has integrated NCDs into its essential health package and health insurance coverage, a major step towards equitable access to services. These examples of best practice remind us that the multisectoral structures formed in response to COVID-19 need to be leveraged to address NCDs. Investment is needed to implement NCD roadmaps that integrate prevention and treatment into primary care. And broader advocacy with non-health sectors is imperative since more determinants of NCDs fall outside the health sector than within it. The proposed International NCD Compact 2022-2030 promises to be a valuable tool along with the Global Action Plan for NCD Prevention and Control to 2030. We as WHO stand ready to continue providing leadership and support to guide the implementation of best practices. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Machidiso Moeti, for your statement. And at this point, I'm happy to announce and inform all of us that we have received in our midst the First Ladies of Congo and Ghana. You're welcome, Your Excellencies. And we are so happy that you're here. So next, we'd like to take the statement from the WHO Global Ambassador for NCDs in the person of Michael Bloomberg. Hello, everyone. Let me thank President Akufu Addo, Prime Minister Stura, Dr. Tedros, and all the leaders joining us today as we fight one of the world's biggest killers, non-communicable diseases. Governments increasingly have the tools to prevent non-communicable diseases like cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. However, countries are not on track to meet the UN's 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Of course, COVID certainly hasn't helped, 
The pandemic has exposed vulnerabilities in health systems worldwide. Our job together is to make sure more countries take immediate action to save millions of lives. And we don't have a moment to waste. To help, WHO just published a new report, Saving Lives, Spending Less. It shows that lower income countries can reap both health and economic benefits when they spend on targeted interventions against NCDs. WHO also created a roadmap to 2025 to keep countries moving towards important NCD goals. And the leadership of everyone here is critical to ensuring countries have the political will to do the right thing so we can prevent the diseases that rob so many people of their health and happiness. From the Bloomberg Philanthropies team, thank you for your partnership in this life-saving work. Right. Thank you so much, Mr. Michael Bloomberg, for your statements. And we are in Ghana, and we are privileged to have our first lady. So if we all, all be upstanding, we would like to acknowledge her presence with the national anthem for Ghana. So being fortunate to have in person in this room with us today are two first ladies from Ghana and Congo who would at this point like to take their statements. The first lady of Congo has shown immense support for NCDs as the president of the Organization of African First Ladies for Development she has shown great leadership in advancing the agenda of women and children health. Her Excellency Antoinette Sasu Ingueso is here today in solidarity with the agenda of promoting the prevention and control of NCDs. Ladies and gentlemen, shall we welcome Her Excellency Antoinette Sasu Ingueso to deliver her speech. With a round of applause, please. Shall we keep doing it? Until she mounts the stage, Pals will take the cultural display to invite her upstage, please.
Distingués invités, distinguées premières dames et chères sœurs, mesdames, messieurs, je que je préside encore pour quelques semaines, l'Organisation des Premières Dames d'Afrique pour le Développement, je saisis cette opportunité pour rendre un nouvel hommage à toutes celles qui ont été en première ligne ces deux dernières années contre la pandémie coronavirus d'Akra à Réré, de Brazzaville à Dix, à Beba, en passant par Dakar et Nairobi. Scientifiques, personnels soignants, actrices associatives, en un mot, toutes nos communautés se sont levées pour combattre ce mal. Sur la marche du monde n'a pas été interrompue pour autant. Et le lien entre les questions du genre et la santé se sont révélés d'une actualité brûlante. Nous, les premières dames d'Afrique, sommes au cœur de ces problématiques. En 20 ans d'existence, notre organisation a été témoin des ravages que d'autres épidémies, bien avant le la COVID-19, ont infligé aux femmes et aux filles d'Afrique. C'est le cas du VIH sida nous permet de faire le lien entre une bonne politique genre et une prise en charge sanitaire adéquate et efficace. À cet effet, en ce qui concerne la protection contre les maladies non transmissibles, je pense que l'éducation, la sensibilisation et la communication de tous les instants des filles, des mères et des parents de façon générale sont de levier connaît des évolutions inégales sur notre continent, notamment dans l'accès aux soins de santé de qualité. Comme le montre l'indice de développement de genre des Nations Unies, plusieurs obstacles freinent la bonne prise en charge sanitaire des mères et des filles sur notre continent. Le manque d'accès des femmes aux ressources financières du ménage qui peut limiter les moyens de payer les coûts de santé, le manque d'éducation des mères, l'inégale répartition des tâches dans la famille qui détourne le père des soins de santé donnés aux enfants, les problèmes de sécurité et de mobilité qui peuvent décourager les femmes, surtout celles avec des jeunes enfants, à se déplacer vers les infrastructures de santé, etc. C'est donc un travail de longue haleine qui concerne l'ensemble de la société. La couverture vaccinale pour certaines maladies non transmissibles, comme le cancer du col de l'utérus, c'est dû 
à ces maladies. Nous sommes convaincus que si l'autonomie du genre est atteinte dans nos sociétés, le cancer du col de l'utérus, par exemple, sera largement évitable grâce à la promotion et à l'acceptation d'une vaccination massive des jeunes filles. À ce titre, nous appuyons le programme de développement durable de l'OMS à l'horizon 2030 qui reconnaît les maladies non transmissibles comme un défi majeur pour la santé mondiale. Dans le cadre de ce programme, les chefs d'État et de gouvernement se sont engagés à monter des actions nationales ambitieuses et de réduire d'un tiers la mortalité prématurée due aux maladies non transmissibles grâce à la prévention et au traitement. Les femmes africaines ne peuvent que souscrire à ce programme et créer des conditions susceptibles de favoriser sa mise en œuvre. Relever ce défi passe aussi par la promotion de l'égalité des genres. Aller vers l'autonomisation des femmes et des filles n'est pas juste une question de principe. C'est le cinquième objectif de développement durable qui nous tient particulièrement à cœur. Au sein de l'OPDAD, nous avons fait que l'ODD 5, à savoir, à savoir parvenir à l'égalité des sexes et autonomiser toutes les femmes et les filles, un axe majeur de notre plan stratégique. L'autonomisation des femmes et des filles, la défense de leur santé et de leurs droits sexuels et reproductifs, l'élimination de toutes les formes de discrimination fondées sur le genre dans tous les domaines de la vie sociale, politique et économique sont autant des points d'appui pour atteindre le développement durable. Nous devons donc toutes et tous être mobilisés pour améliorer les conditions de santé des femmes et des filles sur notre continent. Joignons nos forces pour faire de l'Afrique un continent avec des enfants, des jeunes et des femmes en bonne santé et autonomes. C'est la raison d'être de l'OPDAD et nous, les Premières Dames d'Afrique, grâce à notre position et notre expertise unique, continuerons de favoriser une prise de conscience dans les domaines du genre et de la santé. Avec le soutien précieux de nos communautés et de nos partenaires, bien sûr. Les femmes et les filles bien éduquées, bien autonomisées et en bonne santé donneront à notre continent une trajectoire irversible vers son développement durable. Vive la coopération internationale. Je vous remercie. the first lady of Congo. Shall we give her another round of applause? Now we've come to hear the statement from our first lady here in Ghana. I'm honored to be calling upon her to give us her statement. The first lady of Ghana, through the Rebecca Foundation has been instrumental in many health projects that have supported children in this country. 
as an advocate for NCDs, she has shown great interest in childhood cancers. Through her advocacy and leadership, four childhood cancers, including Burkitt lymphoma, Wilms tumor, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and retinoblastoma are now covered by the National Health Insurance Scheme. She has also launched the Childhood Cancer Society of Ghana, which has been taxed to ensure improvement in outcomes of childhood cancers in Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Her Excellency Rebecca Ekufuado to deliver her speech. Chairman Nana Prajan Sem the Sixth, Her Excellency Madame Antoinette Sassoon Gueso, Excellencies, Honorable Ministers of State, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to be invited to be part of this important meeting on non communicable diseases and sustainable development goals. The third target of the Global Sustainable Development Goals seeks to ensure good health and promote healthy living for people of all ages. Ghana has made some strides combating infectious diseases, but we need to take a critical look at non-communicable diseases if we want to achieve SDG3. Non-communicable diseases such as high blood pressure, and diabetes are fast becoming common even among young people. Even though these can lead to decreased quality of life and death, they do not invoke the fear and helplessness associated with cancer. Cancer is perceived as costly, painful, drawn out, and fatal. Indeed, being diagnosed with cancer is considered equivalent to being given a death sentence. In 2020, Globacan estimated that there were over 24,000 new cancer cases in Ghana, leading to nearly 16,000 deaths. This means 66% of people diagnosed with cancer died. This is a green picture. The major contributors to this picture are the two leading female cancers, breast and cervical cancers, and prostate cancer in men. Again, childhood cancer seem to be on the rise. Is it a case of better patronage because of better awareness? I don't know. But what I do know is that it is a worrying phenomenon which needs to be addressed as a matter of urgency. Currently, access to medicines, diagnostics, and treatment of cancers in Ghana are fraught with some challenges. These include lack of awareness of the disease, late disease presentation and diagnosis, cost of treatment, and inadequate qualified personnel and infrastructure. We have to change this narrative. We need to step up education, targeting improved awareness, prompt screening, early diagnosis and treatment by trained professionals. Parents must also be educated to report bulges, growths, and unusual symptoms in their children to health personnel. We must promote periodic regular checkups and screening for the general populace, depending on age and family history. People need to know that early diagnosis is a major step in combating cancers successfully. We also need to encourage better lifestyle choices there must be a concerted campaign on dietary choices 
and the uptake of regular physical activities. Another factor that should be considered as a matter of agency is the training of health personnel to ensure early diagnosis and prompt treatment. For most cancer patients, the cost of treatment is a deterrent to seeking medical help. Recently, our advocacy paid off with inclusion of four childhood cancers to the National Health Insurance Scheme Benefits Package. Maybe, maybe it is time to consider the expansion to include all cancers. This will without doubt change the health seeking behavior of Ghanaians. Most cancers can be cured if detected early. We need to act urgently to address the current gaps in cancer prevention, detection, and treatment. That is why it is so important to have strategic partners. It provides an opportunity to access a broader range of resources and expertise and gain competitive advantage in a world that has increasingly become competitive. So my expect expectation is that this meeting comes up with actionable steps. This will get all of us closer to achieving the SDG3 and its related goals. I thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, Rebecca Ekufuado. Indeed, we hope that this meeting will come up with actionable plans to see the way forward, the reason why we are here today. May I remind us that um, on our equipment, you'll find translations for Spanish in channel, on channel four, translations for French on channels two and three, and then for English on channel five. Right, so we'd like to take, invite the Ghana Dance Ensemble to give us a cultural display. Ghana Dance Ensemble.
That was the Ghana Dance Ensemble displaying some of our rich culture here in Ghana. Thank you, Ghana Dance Ensemble, for that rich display of culture. All right, so Mr. Chair, we began taking statements from the various regional offices of WHO and at this point, we would like to continue with those statements with your permission. If so, thank you. I have received the go ahead from Mr. Chair. So we would now like to take the next recorded statement from the WHO Regional Office for Europe. And we'll be taking that statement from Dr. Hans Henry P. Kluge. Shall we take the statement now, please? Okay, right, so whilst waiting for the statement from the regional office for Euro, are we ready? Okay, so the next statement from the Pan-American Health Organization. Excellency Nana Akufo-Addo, President of Ghana. Excellency Jonas Gar Stor, Prime Minister of Norway. Dr. Tedros, Director General of WHO. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It really gives me great pleasure to greet you today from the Pan-American Health Organization in Washington, DC. The COVID-19 pandemic is still having a disproportionate impact on people living with NCDs. And this has been coupled with the mental health toll. In the Americas, there are 250 million people living with an NCD, and many have suffered the consequences of disruptions in primary healthcare services. At PAHO, we are developing and, and sharing evidence-based health information and providing evidence-based guidance to the public, healthcare providers, and health authorities 
on NCDs and COVID-19 as a trusted source of evidence-based health information. We are intensifying our efforts to strengthen the diagnosis and treatment of NCDs while supporting regulatory measures for tobacco control, healthy eating, and alcohol reduction. In this context, I am pleased to note that South America has become the first multi-nation continent to be free of tobacco smoke in public spaces. Major public health successes are therefore possible. And we must all continue to work together to get back on track to achieving the sustainable development goals related to NCDs. Reducing the burden of NCDs will require major health systems reform. So I pledge my unwavering commitment to work with countries in our region to promote the implementation of policies and interventions to ensure the optimal integration of the management of NCDs in primary care as we work towards universal health coverage and universal health access. Now is the time for the transformative changes in health systems to optimally manage NCDs. Thanks for your attention. Right, thank you, Dr. Carissa F. Etienne, and that was a statement from the regional director for the Pan-American Health Organization. Now we'll take a statement for, from the WHO Regional Office for Southeast Asia, and to give us that statement will be Dr. Punam Ketrapal Singh. Excellencies, distinguished participants, colleagues, partners. My sincere thanks to the governments of Ghana and Norway for co-organizing this international strategic dialogue on non-communicable diseases and the sustainable development goals. This flagship initiative, which brings together two countries in the African region and three in the Southeast Asia region is very much aligned with our own flagship priorities, which since 2014 have included preventing and controlling NCDs through high impact and cost-effective best buy interventions guided by each country's multi-sectoral NCD action plan. Need it be said, we embark on this dialogue at a critical moment. The COVID-19 pandemic must catalyze renewed and ramped up action to address NCDs through whole of government and whole of society approaches. Such approaches must adequately address the economic, social and developmental aspects of NCDs from unhealthy air and exposure to harmful chemicals to food systems that cause both underweight and obesity, a lack of green and healthy spaces in urban areas, and inadequate regulation of the advertising and sale of unhealthy products such as alcohol and tobacco. The evidence is clear people who are socio-economically challenged are more vulnerable to unhealthy behaviors. To mitigate such vulnerabilities, a differential response is needed, a response that leverages the unique first-hand experience such people and communities have in line with the groundbreaking Nothing for Us Without Us meeting and report. But as this flagship initiative highlights, we must also leverage the full impact of high-level commitment and action, not only from the health sector, but from across sectors and at all levels, including heads of state and governments, and with the support of catalytic and sustained funding from our many partners and friends. Strong primary health care and universal health coverage 
robust implementation research and the collection and analysis of timely and reliable data, evidence-based legislation, regulation, and fiscal interventions, the effective harnessing of digital technology and innovations, these are among the most powerful tools we have to turn the tide and achieve our 2025 and 2030 targets. They are tools which are at the very heart of the Southeast Asia region's new strategy for primary health care and our forthcoming NCD implementation roadmap 2022-2030. I wish this dialogue all success and reiterate the region's steadfast commitment to a multi-sectoral and inclusive NCD response, ensuring all people have access to quality, safe, effective, affordable, and essential medical products and technologies to prevent, screen, diagnose, and treat NCDs, today's greatest development challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Poonam Ketrapal Singh for your statements. Indeed, they resonate with our feelings and our aspirations and our intentions in this room. And thank you once more for that statement. So last not, not, but not least of the statements from our regional offices will be the statement from our West Pacific Regional Office, and I would like to invite the statement from Dr. Takeshi Kasai. Shall we take the statement from Dr. Takeshi Kasai? Honorable Chair, distinguished guests, the world is dynamically changing, economically, socially, and environmentally. Between 1990s and 2017, the total gross domestic product of countries in the Western Pacific regions tripled as a result of rapid aging, urbanizations, lifestyle changes, and climate change. The burden of non-communicable diseases is increasing in the Western Pacific region and now accounting for more than 85% of all deaths. Health is invisible but essential for all human activities. Therefore, addressing NCD is a prerequisite for sustainable development. It must be considered an investment rather than a cost. After many years of experience and research, we know what we need to be done. Therefore, the issue is no longer what, but how. We need to tailor this how, not only at the national level, but to each community as well. In many countries, communities have a strong networks, exciting assets, and programs which can assist effort for NCD prevention and control. Healthy, enabling environments requires the collaborations of many stakeholders beyond health. It is critical to engage with the key partners and stakeholders within and beyond the health sectors to fight the NCD epidemic together. This is also an area where our learn and improve approach, which we frequently apply in our region, is needed so that people are able to share experiences within and across countries. WHO is committed to working with the member states and partners in strengthening the response to NCDs. Our region's vision for the future identified NCDs and aging as one of four thematic priorities, and we'll discuss the new regional action framework on NCDs during the upcoming 73 regional committee meeting for the Western Pacific. I would like to thank the President of Ghana and Prime Minister of Norway for hosting this important dialogue. I look forward to hearing the outcome of these discussions and to continue working with our member states and partners on this important topic. 
Thank you very much. Indeed, the management and control of NCDs is a, requires a multi-stakeholder approach. And when I look across this room, it's filled with stakeholders from relevant stakeholders that are needed for this agenda to be actually realized. So we would like to now take, I understand that the recorded message for the regional director of our Euro office is ready. And we'd like to take that final statement before we move on. And that statement will be given to us by Dr. Hans Henry P. Kluge. Is the statement ready? Okay, looks like they're still having technical difficulties in that regard. So we'll move on. Now, the NCD Alliance is a global agency that advocates for NCD's prevention and control. And we also are happy that they also have a statement to share with us in solidarity of this whole subject of NCD's control and management. So we'll now I'd like to take another recorded video statement from the president-elect of the NCD Alliance in the person of Dr. Monica Arora. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am Monica Arora, the president-elect of the NCD Alliance. On behalf of our members and partners, I would like to thank the organizers for convening this important meeting today. The high level political leadership and commitment displayed at this international dialogue is the essential ingredient we need to ensure NCDs remain a priority on health and development agendas. I would like to share one simple message with governments today. We have the evidence, the solutions, tools and the know-how and the political will to get back on track to meet the global NCD targets. Achieving the global NCD targets will also accelerate the progress of the UHC targets. The imperative for action is clear and urgent. NCDs will cost more sufferings and lives this decade than any other health issue. It will drain the global economy and impede human capital. NCDs will both fuel and be fueled by the growing inequalities in our countries and globally. And it will also undermine any efforts to ensure the world is better prepared for future pandemics after COVID-19. Inaction and paralysis is not a viable option. The message I would like you to take away is one of optimism and hope. With decisive action and investments by government now on NCDs, the majority of governments can reach SDG target 3.4 by 2030. This is the main finding of a new paper published in The Lancet by the NCD Countdown Collaboration. Progress is possible, it is reachable, and it is feasible for all countries. And the return on investments for governments are high and compelling in the short and long terms in terms of lives saved and economic gains. As the end date of the 2025 NCD targets and the 10th anniversary of the adoption of the SDGs loom nearer, we look to all governments to rise to the challenge, take bold action and bend the curve on NCDs. The stakes could not be higher. We really cannot afford to fail. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monica Aurora. And she's the president-elect of the NCD Alliance. And indeed, 
we remain optimistic and hopeful, knowing that the target we have set before us is possible and reachable. So we we'll now like to invite once more to display, give us a cultural display, the Ghana Dance Ensemble, before we take our next statement. So the Ghana Dance Ensemble. Will be this.
Thank you, Ghana Dance Ensemble. Shall we do it once more? I would expect that during their displays, we could try our feet on some of the dances, if we are up to it. Quite energetic. All right, so NCDs affect individuals like you and I, and people living with hypertension, diabetes, cancer, mental health, sickle cell, and chronic respiratory diseases have experiences in their journey towards control. Um, those of us who were at the meeting yesterday, I'm sure we heard from one of those patients. So today, we'll hear some more of these patients share their experiences through recorded video statements once again. So we would first like to hear from the face patient living with NCDs who will speak to us about his or her journey um, with cancer. So take that first statement from the patient. My name is Mary. I am seven years old. Mary was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia at Kolibu Teaching Hospital after visiting many other hospitals. Yarene is not a fire day. Mary is just one of about 1,300 children who will develop cancer in Ghana this year. In low and middle income countries like Ghana, as few as 20% of children will survive compared to over 80% in the UK. World Child Cancer are working to support children just like Mary by providing families with financial and emotional support, supporting the training of more doctors and nurses, and raising awareness of childhood cancer in low and middle income countries around the world. We all have a part to play in giving children like Mary a happy, healthy future. Just 47 pounds could pay for a round of Thank you, so that was a story from the young lady we saw regarding her journey with cancer. And indeed, we all have a part to play. We shall now take the next story from a patient's um, journey, a patient's journey with cardiovascular disease. My name is Erickson Atakwatsun. I'm 46 years old. I was diagnosed with hypertensive in 2017 and I've lived with it and it caused my stroke the same year 2017. The disease has impacted negatively on my finances and me myself because Due to the hypertensive, I was laid out of work because of the risks involved working up a ladder and other things. Health insurance does not cover the payment of some of the prescribed drugs. So you have to buy it yourself or pay for the cost personally yourself. With this, it was very difficult. And there are people similar with my situation who may be going through maybe worse than what I am going through. The most difficult part is I'm having three different uh, CDS. I'm having a hypertensive, I'm a diabetic at the same time, and living with stroke too. It's very difficult getting medical care for these three different diseases because they are not all situated at one health center. I have to be moving from different health care to other. That has caused many financial difficulties for me. I would advise that the government comes to our aid and include CDS, the non-communicable diseases, to all the community health clinics that we could be able to assess our health clinic there. I plead that the government comes to our aid and individuals and organizations to come to our aid and even set up community health care centers around for we people living with hypertensive, diabetics, and stroke and non-communicable diseases to get closer there 
most often to see and check of our conditions and other things. That would have been better for us. My advice to the general public and to my fellow people who are happen to have intensive and stroke is you may not know when it comes. And assessing healthcare too is not that easy. But you have to try as much as possible once every month to check the level of your sugar, your BP, and other non-communicable diseases. You want to clap? Please do. It cannot get more real than we see. And I know that all of us in this room recognize our individual and collective roles in stemming the tide. Okay, so next we'll hear from a patient and she'll speak to us about her journey with chronic respiratory disease. I'm Tanya Winders, the president of Global Allergy and Airways Patient Platform, GAP, an umbrella organization representing over 70 patient advocacy groups from throughout the world and representing the over 600 million individuals currently living with chronic respiratory diseases like asthma, COPD, and others. It's my pleasure to be with you today and to implore member states to really value the unique perspectives of those living with chronic respiratory disease as we work together to advance the NCD SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. In fact, we at GAP stand ready to assist in raising awareness and educating patients, caregivers, healthcare providers, and policymakers about the burden and rising prevalence of chronic respiratory disease. We know that almost 1 billion people living on the planet today will be impacted by these chronic respiratory diseases. And now is the time to work together to advance care, to ensure that we mitigate the environmental health hazards and exposures that may be advancing respiratory disease, as well as to ensure universal health coverage and access to essential medications. Again, thank you to the member states and to the World Health Organization for advancing chronic respiratory disease and elevating it as a policy priority. Thank you also for sharing your story with us. Shall we now take the, page, the story of the patient living with diabetes, please? Living with diabetes, the side of the world, is very challenging. Especially, we have made a negative attitude towards people. Secondly, access to health care is also difficult because there are long waiting periods at the various hospitals and in this COVID era, where our immunity is low as diabetics, you have to wait for long periods before it's your time to see a doctor. When you see doctors too, because of patient-doctor ratio, there is not much time to get as much information as one needs to get when you leave the clinic. We also have challenges with costs because if you want to live on a cartridge in Sonic, which is a modern type, you will need to spend over 800 Ghana city seconds. As a diabetic, you need to buy strips constantly. If you're going to check your sugar daily, you need to take off lancets, you need to take off syringes. Insulin is expensive. Once you get to the health service, you don't get the quality and type of insulin you might need. You are faced with a situation where you need to use generics. And the laboratory investigations too are expensive. You need to budget about 
thousand to two thousand four hundred Ghana per quarter for laboratory investigations. My advice to the general public is: diabetes is expensive. Don't allow yourself to get diabetes. Eat healthy. Exercise. Take your medications too if you are diabetic. Reply and visit your doctor for your follow-up appointments. Diabetes is not a death sentence with regards to access to facilities. We suggest, as we have 275 districts in Ghana, if we could have one walking diabetes information center, not a day, where pamphlets and peer groups can meet and people can have information about the condition. It will go along because we have a lot of diabetes in Ghana and the statistics continue growing. With regards to costs, if government can subsidize insulin and all diabetes equipment or lancet strips, glucometer syringes, it will be good if possible if it, if they could be free one major thing that bothers us a lot too is when you go on hospital admission where you would have to have a finger print each hour it makes diabetics when they go into ketoacidosis or admission very expensive if it is possible if OPD fingerprints and admission fingerprints can go for free, great. Thank you, thank you, Madam, for sharing your story with us. Indeed, she speaks to the strengthening of our primary health care, which I believe is one of the strategies that is captured in this journey that we are beginning in Ghana and beyond. So now I'd like to hear, of course, from a patient living with mental health. Shall we take that recorded video now, please? So my name is Esnam Dra. I'm 27 years old and I have lived experience with bipolar disorder. I was diagnosed with this condition in 2015. So the first time I think my condition has had any impact on me was when I was fired from my job in 2019 after I disclosed to a member of management about my condition. I was called for a meeting and I was labeled as violent and aggressive when I hadn't showed any symptom at all. But they thought because of my condition, I'll be a threat to the organization. That was the first time that I actually felt the sting of stigma. Living with this condition for about six to seven years now, I can say that it has really affected my family in terms of our finances. For many years, my parents had to support me by buying my medication for me, making sure I'm able to attend review appointments. At the time of my diagnosis, I was a third year student at the university and some of my friends noticed a change in my behavior. Some of them thought I was different, acting weird, and it made them move away from me. I sort of understand them because it was very difficult to live with me. My symptoms were getting very chronic. And, you know, with this condition, it makes life hard for those who are trying to support you and love you. So I lost some friends, but by God's grace, things are better now. The issue in Ghana right now is that most people with a mental health conditions are not able to work and to be able to afford some of these services. And it's not easy because you have to constantly go to the hospital for review appointments and daily take medications, which aren't cheap at all. And so one of the things that I would really be happy about is if mental health is made a subject in school. As early as nursery, something that is a non-scoring course, which students can take and learn more about mental health, I believe that if I had learned about mental health earlier, I would have taken my mental health very, very seriously. Okay, so I'd like to say that mental health conditions are like 
other chronic illnesses. It's not something weird or strange. And it's not something far away from you. People think that they can never develop a mental health condition. Both good and bad experiences can trigger mental health conditions. So I'd like to encourage everyone to empathize with people who have mental health conditions and everyone should practice self-care to make sure that their mental health is always in check. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Indeed, she speaks of affordability and accessibility. And she also speaks of an all, gov all of government and all of society approach to tackling mental health issues. Last but not least, um, on our patient journeys, um, stories, would like to take a story from a patient living with sickle cell disease. My name is Lea Kilenga Masamo Bay. I'm a patient advocate living in Kenya. I am 33 years and I've lived my entire life with sickle cell. I was born into a family where three out of four children have sickle cell. Growing up, sickle cell was associated with witchcraft, which meant that we faced a lot of stigma and discrimination from the community and family imposing fencing rituals on us. The unpredictability of sickle cell meant that school attendance and school completion was disrupted, which translated to lack of job competitiveness and reduced income and earning opportunities. In Kenya and other African countries, sickle cell is considered uninsurable, which meant that families like mine and myself incur large out-of-pocket financial expenditures managing complications, hospitalizations, disabilities throughout our lives. Sickle cell access to care is centralized in urban areas with few government hospitals with sickle cell care. This means limited access to essential medicines, trained healthcare providers, and readily available diagnostics limit our ability to live high quality of life predisposing us to preventable complications, disabilities, and unnecessary death. We unfortunately lost my sister throughout uh, our lives in sickle cell due to the lack of access to sickle cell care. My recommendation to the heads of state is in order to achieve the NCT targets and SDG of health, we need to ensure national, regional, and global inclusion and prioritization of NCDs that have been long neglected, like sickle cell, that anyone, wherever they live, whatever age they're at, and whatever NCD they have, they enjoy the right to health. I want to urge heads of state to commit to community involvement in co-creation of solutions around NCDs and to guarantee the continuous meaningful involvement of people living with NCDs, like myself, in positions of power and influence to leverage our lived experiences to inform systems, policies, and the NCD response. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Trained healthcare professionals, access to trained healthcare professionals is what I heard her mention, as well as access to good quality diagnostics. Thank you once more and thanks to all the patients who have shared their stories with us today. Mr. Chair, our regional office in Europe really wants to give his statement. So I'll kindly request once more that we give him the opportunity to share his statement with us and then we'll move on from there. Thank you. So we'll take the statement from the regional director of our regional office for Europe. All right. Unfortunately, it didn't work out the third time. We really would have loved to hear from him. But um, I'm sure we would have access to those statements even after here. So at this point, I would like to 
Thank you so much for keeping put till now. And before we move on to the next agenda item, I have been informed that we have earned a two minute break, health break. You want to stand, you want to move side and side, you want to visit the washroom, you have two minutes to do that quickly, and then we continue with our program. Thank you. And whilst we are at it, can we get some music interlude from the police band, please? Thank you. Two minutes, please. That's 120 seconds.
We're unmuted. Hi, testing one, two, three. T testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. This is Geneva. We are unmuted and we can, okay, you can hear me? Okay, thank you. All right.
Thank you. But before I call the next personality on stage, I have in my hand a bunch of keys. I believe the owner is in this room. It was found in the men's washroom. So if you are missing a bunch of keys, please see me and identify yourself for collection. So our Honorable Minister for Health, Kwekwa Jiman Menu, MP for Doma Central, has been a strong advocate. I remember in the days of AMR. And today we are speaking of non communicable diseases, and he's been a strong advocate for non communicable diseases prevention and control. So it is therefore my privilege to call on our Honorable Minister to come up stage and give us his remarks. Honorable Kwekwa Ajiman Menu, please. Excellencies, the President of our Republic, the Prime Minister of Norway, and the Director General of the WHO. Nana Chair, Excellencies, the First Lady of Congo, Her Excellency Antoinette Sassungwesu, and our First Lady, Her Excellency Rebecca Akufuado. Excellencies, the ambassador of Norway and all members of the diplomatic corps here present, colleague ministers of state, honorable members of parliament, all our development partners, our health specialists and experts, chief executives and heads of agencies of the Ministry of Health and other ministries. Our directors of the Ministry of Health and its agencies, representatives of ministries, departments, and agencies, members of 
a local and international press corps, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Let me in the first instance, with a very heavy heart, announce to you that the president will not be available here in person with us due to other national exigencies. And I must apologize profusely for this particular challenge. Despite his absence, he has delegated one of our own to present his statement on his behalf. But his assurance is his commitment, and he is here with us in spirit. The Prime Minister of Norway will speak to us online, as well as the Director General of WHO. But before I give my statement, let me again express my extreme gladness to welcome all of you to the Accra, to Accra, Ghana, for this first ever high-level international strategic dialogue on non-communicable diseases. And my most welcome to the First Lady from Congo and all other uh, directors and high-level personnel who travel from outside our country to join us this morning. Ghana is really proud to be selected to host this all-important international strategic dialogue under the distinguished leaderships of the President of the Republic of Ghana and the Prime Minister of Norway and the Director General of WHO. Today's meeting was preceded by a national dialogue held yesterday to set the scene for the global agenda and call for action in the context of pivoting leadership for NCD disability. The global explosion of non-communicable diseases in the last few decades had been as a result of lifestyle changes. The links across ob obesity, cancer, heart diseases, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, chronic respiratory diseases, and mental disorders, and the negative impact of these diseases on the quality of life and productivity of people has affected all facets of our lives. The justification for whole of governments and whole of society's approach to addressing the NCD canker is a major driver for ensuring that this new approach is adopted to add value for long-term measures to address the situation. Our country alone cannot do it, and it is important that international actions support local actions to ensure that there is value addition to addressing NCDs. In doing this, leadership is key and strategic. Ghana is therefore happy that this international strategic dialogue aims to raise the profile of the NCDs agenda within the SDGs internationally and bring together national and international actors and partners to share knowledge and ideas with key stakeholders from the public and private sectors. The academic and business world and international development experts for immediate action. The lessons of COVID-19 has taught us effective partnerships and collaborations in a multi-stakeholder approach is strategic to move the NCD agenda forward. It is our hope that this Accra International Strategic Dialogue will accelerate the adoption of pragmatic actions to reduce the astronomical and devastating effects of NCDs of the people of the world. To our special foreign guests, I urge you all to feel at home and let your visit to Ghana be a memorable one. We have a number of tourist attractions and interesting places to visit whilst you are here. Take some time out and see around the capital city. We have the Art Center and the Kwame Nkrumah Museum where you can get our revered Kente fabrics and other artifacts from other West African cultures. Our beaches are also open for your relaxation after this meeting. Once again, on behalf of the president, the government and the good people of Ghana, 
I say Akwaba to all of you, and also wish, wish us all very fruitful deliberations. God bless us all. I thank you. So thank you very much, Honorable Minister. That was the Honorable Minister for Health, Honorable Kwekwajman Menu, MP for Doma Central. Thank you for welcoming us and thank you for those very inspirational words that you've shared with us. So ladies and gentlemen, this is still the International Strategic Dialogue taking place here in the Kempinski Hotel in the vibrant city of Accra, Ghana, West Africa. And as our minister has indicated, do find time to visit some of our sites and tourist sites before you go back to your countries. Okay, so next on our agenda, we'll be hearing from um, a woman I respect so much. We've heard from her virtually today, but interestingly, she's with us and we get to hear from her in person. So I have the privilege to her to introduce the first woman elected as WHO Regional Director for Health. She is also a strong leader who has led the transformation agenda of WHO in Africa to ensure the organization is accountable, effective, and driven by results. Her leadership and advocacy towards achieving universal health coverage has inspired and built momentum across the region to improve health financing and delivery of essential health services towards the achievement of SDG 3.8. Having served as Assistant Director of Non-Communicable Diseases, she has shown strong commitment towards achieving SDG 3.4. It is also interesting to note that she has received an honorary doctorate right here in Ghana from the University of Health and Allied Sciences. Your Excellencies, Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Dr. Machidiso Moeti, the WHO Regional Director for Africa to deliver her speech. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Your Excellencies, the President of Ghana and the Prime Minister of Norway, Dr. Tedros, my boss and dear brother, Your Excellencies, the First Ladies of Ghana and of the Republic of the Congo, other heads of state and government that have joined this meeting virtually, Honorable Minister of Health, Honorable Kwakwe Egiman Manu, senior government officials, Ambassadors and High Commissioners accredited to Ghana, development partners, colleagues in the UN agencies, other stakeholders, people living with NCDs, and members of the press. First, thank you for putting up with me twice in this meeting. I'm very privileged to be able to address you in this way, really. I'd like to thank the President of Ghana, the Prime Minister of Norway, and WHO's Director General for co-hosting this international strategic dialogue on NCD, NCDs and the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for your determination to make a difference in this very important problem. It's an honor for me then to talk about, this, to talk to this meeting where we're going to be reviewing progress towards attaining the 2030 2030 NCD targets and defining how to overcome the obstacles, particularly in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. We were very privileged and encouraged yesterday to learn about the great strides that Ghana is making towards a future in which NCDs will no longer pose such a heavy toll on people's health, households, finances, and the country's economy. It was agreed that a great deal of collective effort will be required to overcome the remaining hurdles. NCDs pose with each passing year 
a greater threat to the health and lives of African people and the continent's socioeconomic development. In 1990, NCDs and injuries were responsible for 28%, so just over a quarter of illness and just over a third of deaths in Sub-Saharan Africa. In 2020, in 2020, they caused over half the deaths in almost 10 countries and between 40 and just under 50% in 17 more countries, with many occurring at a much younger age than in other parts of the world. Thus, the region faces a double burden with communicable diseases. Decisive action to address the determinants and the risk factors of NCDs needs to be scaled up and speeded up. Heads of state and government have collectively agreed that NCDs are among the most important public health and development problems facing humanity today and have made over the past 10 years various political commitments to address them. Countries have agreed to promote meaningful civil society engagement to implement ambitious national multi-sectoral responses and to forge multi-stakeholder partnerships and alliances and amplify the voices and enable the agency of people and communities living with and affected by NCDs. Indeed, we heard from eloquent testimonies of people living with NCDs, how urgent and important it is that we make faster progress. Inspiring examples of action in some countries include in order to encourage physical activity, municipalities in Cabo Verde, for example, having established widely accessible, open and safe areas for people to exercise, accessible to people living in the lower economic range as well. Combined with NCD screening and education, these are starting to make a difference in one of the countries with the highest prevalences of NCDs. The Dakar municipality is expanding exercise space as well. That started in more affluent areas, while in Rwanda, car-free Sundays once a month have been introduced, which encourages and a little bit enforces physical activity, reducing air pollution and offering as well NCD screening and information. There are many other examples of legislation and policies that have been put in place by countries, which together are starting to make the difference, but recognizing that much more remains to be done. Remaining challenges include inadequate NCD sub service coverage, low implementation of cost effective, high impact preventive and care interventions, financing of an adequate package of services while reducing out of pocket payments by patients. We're convinced in WHO that shifting investments into enabling primary healthcare facilities to provide services will ensure greater impact and will be excellent return for investment. And we did indeed hear from the testimonies of people living with NCDs that for them, services near where they live would be a huge advantage. And let us not forget communities. They are the most important stakeholders in these actions. So in concluding, I'd like to thank again for your leadership, for your vision, the excellencies, the president of Ghana, the prime minister of Norway, and Dr. Tedros. And I thank all the other heads of state that have joined in this effort for your leadership and for your engagement in this global initiative. We look forward to working with our member states and with partners and stakeholders to achieve the objectives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam RD. And that was the regional director for the regional office for Africa of WHO, Dr. Machidi Somoeti, giving us her statement. So the sustainable development goals were set up in 2015 to achieve sustainable, sustainable development for all by 2030. The global report on NCD has shown that very few countries are on track to achieve the SDG 
which is to reduce by one third premature mortality from NCDs through prevention, treatment, and promote mental health and well being, as well as SDG 3.8, which is to achieve universal health coverage, including financial risk protection, access to quality essential healthcare services and access to safe, effective, quality and affordable essential medicines and vaccines for all. Now, we have a few statements recorded once more from a number of heads of states and government and, and, and governments. And we will now like to listen to those recorded statements that will answer the question, what would it take globally for low and middle income countries to achieve SDG 3.4 and SDG 3.8. And we'll now, I'll, like, I'll now like to um, call for the recorded statement by the president of Barbados, Her Excellency Ms. Maya Amo Motley. Shall we take a recorded statement, please? Excellency Nana Ado Dankwa Akufa Ado, my brother, president of the Republic of Ghana. President of the Republic of Senegal, Your Excellency Makisal, and Chairperson, of course, of the African Union. Your Excellency Jonas Gastore, Prime Minister of Norway, First Ladies of the Republic of Ghana and the Republic of Congo. Dr. Tedros Adnohem Gabrises, my other brother, WHO Director General. Dr. Masido Moti, WHO Regional Director for Africa. Other heads of state and members of the diplomatic corps, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, that was a mouthful, but good morning to each and every one of you. Let me thank my two brothers, President of Ghana and the Director General of the WHO for the most kind invitation to participate in this event today. Even as I chair the One Health Global Leaders Group on the Antimicrobial Resistance, I deem it a priority to be here this morning because non-communicable diseases are robbing Caribbean citizens of their opportunity to reach their true potential as contributors to sustainable development in our countries across the region. NCDs, as they're commonly referred to in mental health conditions, remain the leading causes of death, disease, and disability globally, but equally so in our region and in particular in my own country. These diseases and the major risk factors that contribute to them have enormous negative impacts on health systems, economic productivity, as I mentioned earlier, and the financial stability of our citizens, and indeed the stability of our households. The anticipated global financial impact of NCDs between 2010 and 2030 has been estimated to be as high as 47 trillion US dollars. Cognizant of this enormous threat, CARICOM heads of state and government unanimously adopted the Declaration of Port of Spain 15 years ago in 2007, uniting to stop the epidemic of chronic NCDs. This landmark political decision by CARICOM heads of state and government elevated NCDs to the global stage and led to the first UN high-level meeting, indeed, of the General Assembly on the prevention and control of NCDs in 2011. The political declaration of the UN high-level meeting and the subsequent mandates, including the Sustainable Development Goals, defined a clear roadmap for accelerated action on NCDs, including a set of evidence-based, very cost-effective and feasible interventions, the so-called WHO best buys. A recent global NCD investment case has shown that investing in the WHO best buys would yield a return of seven US dollars for every dollar invested by 2030, and by saving close to seven million lives and adding 50 million healthy life years. However, almost a decade and a half later, most of the world regrettably is not adequately on track to achieve SDG target 3.4, namely to reduce by one third the premature mortality of NCDs by 2030 through prevention and treatment and to promote mental health and well-being, needed, of course, all the more from this pandemic. The lack of progress, talking about pandemic, has been aggravated by it. And, and in fact, we now know that disproportionately affected people living with NCDs and mental health conditions 
have all been in that category that we call comorbidities who have come to be those on the front line of the pandemic. It has also overwhelmed our health systems and has provided an unprecedented public health risk for us as we look at terms of how we control the virus because those with the comorbidities are in fact, as I said, really making it that much more difficult to ensure their wellness. The pandemic has further exacerbated the health inequities and has also negatively impacted on the social determinants of health, which has led to increased poverty, increased job losses and disruption in education, and of course, which in turn will increase the burden of NCDs itself and their risk factors on our population so that there is almost a vicious cycle engulfing us. These broad social and economic impacts are particularly significant for small island developing states such as our own country, which also remains subject to the existing vulnerabilities from the climate crisis and from natural disasters, as we learned one year ago with the eruption of the Sufre volcano in our neighboring island of St. Vincent. Furthermore, the pandemic has also led to an increase, an unprecedented worldwide increase in mental health problems, as I referred to just now. A scientific brief recently published by the WHO estimated that the pandemic has led to a 27.6% increase in cases of major depressive disorder and a 25.6% increase in cases of anxiety disorders. This represents a major wake-up call to all countries to step up mental health services and support and to deal frontally with the stigma that has hitherto been associated with mental um, mental health problems. It is therefore time for bold leadership at the highest level to scale up efforts to tackle NCDs and tackle mental health conditions. It is time for the type of leadership and vision that brought together the CARICOM heads of state and government together in Port of Spain 15 years ago, as I said, in 2007. It is equally time for the type of leadership and solidarity that has allowed us as a region to navigate the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, but which regrettably has not been available at the political level for the global fight of the pandemic. There are many lessons to be learned from this pandemic that we must apply to accelerate action and investment on NCDs and mental health conditions. It has fostered for us a whole of government and a whole of society approach that is essential to halt and reverse the increasing incidence of NCDs. We believe that in the same way we have done this nationally and we're trying to do this regionally, that this should be the approach globally. We believe that we can achieve this by promoting greater policy coherence and coordination and a health in all policies approach that became inevitable over the course of the last two years. But most importantly, we believe that the pandemic has made clear that the convergence between health and the economy is essential to retake the path of sustainable development. And those of us who depend on tourism and travel as our mainstay in our economies know this only too well because the pandemic effectively was to us what a war is to other countries. We've had double digit decline in 2020 and in many cases reversing our development as many as two to three decades. It has taught us therefore the value of investing in comprehensive and universal health care, and my friends, social protection. There are many opportunities to harness this reaffirmed commitment to solidarity, partnerships, and health as a human right, and global public goods, and achieve the long due paradigm shift required to curve the NCD type. These include into area, one, building a food and nutrition security agenda while addressing NCDs and the climate crisis. We are doing that now in the Caribbean community. And there is a major investment conference in agriculture that will allow us to reach those targets of food and nutritional security. And that conference is next month in the neighboring country of Guyana. Two, implementing effective policies to address overweight and obesity, such as front of package warning labels and school nutrition policies. We are very much in the middle of that now in Barbados and in the Caribbean because it is critical for our people, but we recognize that we are also not a large enough market to determine those things on our own. And hence we need to work with other regional blocks to ensure that this becomes a global standard. Thirdly, 
accelerating action to implement the WHO framework convention for tobacco control. And I say so as a former smoker, smoking is not good for you. Fourthly, leveraging the use of health taxes as a public health tool, an action we have taken recently here in Barbados with sweetened drinks, because we have too much of an obesity problem with one in every three children facing obesity. Fifthly, integrating quality NCD prevention and control into our primary health care. This international strategic dialogue, my friends, is a crucial opportunity to mobilize leadership and deliver on our mandates to save lives and livelihoods, building forward better and, I should say, more equitably. I would like to call on my peers to embrace the five responsibilities put forth in the International NCD Compact Outcome Document. One, to advocate as political leaders for the prioritization of NCDs. We've done that in the region and we need to stay focused and to keep doing that. Two, to accelerate action to achieve SDG targets 3.4 and 3.8. Three, to invest in scaling up existing cost-effective high impact interventions. Four, to align and integrate the NCD agenda within core health needs and pressing global health challenges such as the climate crisis. And five, to account ensuring timely, reliable, and sustained surveillance and monitoring. Investing now to address NCDs will reduce the impact of these diseases and their risk factors for many years to come. It will also allow us to be more resilient and better prepared for any future pandemics. I hope, my friends, that this is the start of an ongoing and sustained dialogue that allows us to change course and to successfully achieve the targets that we have set among being able to minimize the incidence of NCDs and indeed to promote the sustainable development goals to which we are all committed for they are simply part of our natural development trajectory for our people. I wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you also, Her Excellency, Ms. Mayor Amomotli, the Prime Minister of Barbados. And uh, I'm almost looking back thinking she's there. <laughs> All right, and her message was packed full. And I know that we are wide awake when we speak about the subject of NCDs and we'll keep awake until we have achieved significant milestones in realizing SDG 3.4, and 3.8. Okay, so now we'll take another recorded statement from the president of Timor List, His Excellency Mr. Taur Matan Ruak. Shall we receive his statement, please? Yes. Head of state, head of government. Your Excellency WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus. Your Excellency WHO Regional Director, Dr. Onam Katerpal Singh. Dear colleagues, let me convey my appreciation to His Excellency Nana Ado Dankwa Akufu Ado, the President of Ghana, and His Excellency Zonas Gar Stoll, the Prime Minister of Norway and WTO for hosting the strategic event. Timor-Leste recognizes the growing threats of NCDs and continues to implement several actions to combat it. These include the enactment of a national tobacco law, implementing the largest tobacco graphic health warning in the world, and recently launched the country's first tobacco cessation center, and they are scaling the implementation of packets of essential non-communicable disease intervention amidst the pandemic. In addition, my government has recently increased taxes on alcohol and tobacco by two and a half times the previous rate. Yet, NCDs continue to be among the leading killers. The population exposure to risk factor is very high. For example, tobacco use is among the highest in the world in both adults and youth. Thus, my government is committed to the path of universal health coverage. Our national health service remains free at the point of delivery. Thus, 
we are the lowest rate of out of pocket expenditure among the whole country in the world. We will continue our efforts for all adults diagnosed with hypertension are on medications and continuing diagnose the preventable cancers like cervix. We will not only make service available universally, but will empower people to seek health care timely and facilitate proactive reaching out to community by service provide to leave no one behind. The NCD situation in my country is also compounded by our vulnerability to the threats of climate change. Pandemic too has reminded us of the intimate relationship between people and planet. Therefore, integrating the NCT service as part of health system resilience and emergency response plan is critical for us. Excellencies, I'm hopeful that with this initiative, we will continue to increase our investment strengthen our global solidarity and generate global one voice for implementing best wise policies to enhance collaboration across sectors in member states. Timor-Leste stands committed to the whole of government and the whole of society. Action to tackle TDs in line with our vision of healthy Timorese in healthy Timor-Leste. Thank you very much. And thank you, Your Excellency. Indeed, just as you indicated, healthy Ghanaians in healthy Ghana. And we could replicate that in as many countries as uh, um, involved and that need to actually tackle this issue of NCDs. Okay, so now we'll take yet another recorded statement. has caused limitations and challenges to the delivery and provision of NCDs 
related services. Patients with NCDs are also among the high-risk groups of COVID-19. I believe that we need to integrate prevention and treatment of NCDs into the public health emergency plan at national, regional, and global levels for better preparedness. Furthermore, a comprehensive and inclusive USC system also contributes significantly to better management and greater access to health services, including NCDs. Thailand stands ready to share our experiences and enhance collaboration with other countries in this area. Finally, Thailand wishes to reaffirm our commitment to the political declaration of the third high-level meeting of the UNGA on the prevention and control of NCDs as we continue to move towards the achievement of SDG 3.4 and other health-related goals for good health and well-being of our people. Thank you, and so And thank you to Your Excellency General Retired Prayut Chanocha. Indeed, we cannot emphasize enough the partnership needed among countries to achieve the relevant SDGs. Thank you once more to all the heads of state who have shared their statements with us today. We have heard in words what we mean by what we want to do to achieve our goal of controlling and managing NCDs. We would like to see through theater and drama what we really mean by what we want to achieve. And so the Ghana Dance Ensemble has put together a skit for us in as much as this is a science-filled discussion. Well, art also finds space within. So I would like to invite the Ghana Dance Ensemble to display to us a skit. Ghana Dance Ensemble, we are ready for you. Thank you. 
It's more for the Ghana dance ensemble. That was a beautiful, beautiful depiction of our discussions here today. I don't know what message each of us took out of the skits, but I saw clearly that NCDs can affect both the old and the young. And your best option will be to seek care in the health facility. Thank you once more, Ghana Dance Ensemble, for that beautiful, beautiful skit. Now, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, Mr. Chair, we have come to an important stage of this event, a critical one, in fact, where we would have some important global world leaders delivering key messages on how to place countries on a path to reach the SDG targets 3.4 and 3.8. In that regard, I am delighted to introduce the WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, who is currently waiting online to give us his statement. Shall we receive the Director General of the World Health Organization, please? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Moderator. Uh, Your Excellency, President Nana Kofo Addo, Your Excellency, First Lady, Your Excellency, Prime Minister Jonas Gahr Sture, WHO Regional Director, Dr. Shidi Moeti, Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends. It's a pleasure to join you. It's impossible to overstate the importance of non communicable diseases which account for seven in 10 deaths globally. By 2030, an estimated 150 million people will die from an NCD. In Ghana alone, 86,000 people die every year from an NCD such as cancer, diabetes, heart, and lung diseases. The great tragedy is that NCDs are largely preventable or manageable. The growing burden of NCDs highlights the many threats to health in the food people eat, the water they drink, the air that they breathe, and the conditions in which they live and work. It also highlights the urgent need to promote healthy behaviors and physical activity. NCDs now account for 85% of all premature mortality in low and middle income countries. People with NCDs are also more susceptible to the risk of developing severe COVID-19 symptoms. NCDs also take a heavy toll on economies, cutting down people in their most productive years. Today, we have heard the first-hand experience of people living with NCDs and mental health conditions and how it has affected their lives and those they love. As I said before, we know how to prevent NCDs and we know how to manage them. In fact, most premature deaths from NCDs can be avoided through cost-effective solutions with a primary healthcare approach 
and universal health coverage. A new report from WHO presents evidence-based policies that represent the most effective and cost-effective actions for countries to reduce the burden of NCDs. With the right strategic investments, countries facing the greatest burden of premature NCD deaths can change course. They can do this by focusing on a few key policies in areas including tobacco and alcohol control, reducing salt intake, increasing physical activity, management of hypertension, diabetes, and vaccination against human papilloma virus. In fact, more than 7 million lives could be saved for just 84 cents per person per year from now until 2030. This investment would realize more than 230 billion US dollars in economic and societal benefits and avert nearly 10 million heart attacks and strokes globally, all by 2030. But domestic and international financing for the solutions remains extremely limited. Today, just 14 countries are on track to achieve the NCD target of the Sustainable Development Goals. Overcoming these challenges requires technical, financial, and above all, political commitment. The new Global Compact on NCDs focuses on five key areas. First, by implementing cost-effective measures to prevent and control NCDs. Second, by making sure that people in humanitarian emergencies can get the medicines they need. Third, by integrating NCDs with primary health care and universal health coverage. Fourth, through comprehensive surveillance and monitoring. And fifth, by addressing mental health in policies and programming. I thank President Sture for his leadership in making Norway the first country to include NCDs in its development strategy. Other bilateral donors should consider Norway's example. I thank President Akufoado for his global leadership and advocacy to boost investment in NCDs. And thank you to the government of both Norway and Ghana for launching the Global NCD Compact 2020-2030. I would like to leave you with three key priorities. First, I encourage all WHO member states to join the Global Health of States and Government Group and sign the NCD Compact and to convene at the UN General Assembly in September to commitment to this life-saving effort. Second, follow through on the NCD Compact with the five actions, engage, accelerate, invest, align, and be accountable. Third, by implementing a radical reorientation of health systems towards primary health care as the foundation of universal health coverage. This includes expanding and sustaining access to health promotion and disease prevention, management and control, while addressing the social, commercial, economic, and environmental determinants of health. Dear colleagues and friends, there is no doubt that the global challenge of NCDs is complex and it's daunting, but we have a way forward. Together, using our collective strengths, we can change the paradigm in the prevention and control of NCDs so that everybody around the world can live healthier lives. Again, thank you so much to President, to His Excellency the President and the Prime Minister for hosting us. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros, as we call you for your statement. And indeed, you've shared already some of the thinkings and thoughts we, you know, have discussed here today. And I would like to say that um, we um, will 
harness our strengths collectively in managing and controlling NCDs. And would like to thank you once more for that statement, Dr. Tedros. Okay, so next we would like to hear from the Prime Minister of Norway. And this is a recorded statement we'll be, we'll be receiving from His Excellency, Mr. Jonas Gastor. Shall we receive the statement from the Prime Minister of Norway? Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you to this International Strategic Dialogue on Non-Communicable Diseases and the Sustainable Development Goals. They are so closely linked. I am proud to be co-hosting the dialogue with President Nana Akufu Addo and Dr. Tedros, both close friends. Ghana is one of the partner countries in the WHO Norway flagship initiative on NCDs. I would like to thank President Akufu Addo especially for taking the initiative for this international strategic dialogue. Over the past decades, the incidence of non-communicable diseases, the NCDs, has escalated enormously. These diseases are now the leading cause of death worldwide. And NCDs affect all of us, people of all ages. However, a majority of the deaths attributed to NCDs among young people are occurring in low and middle income countries. What are the explanations? Well, poor nutrition and unhealthy diets are the main cause of death for children under the age of five. Half a million babies die each year because the air they breathe at home is heavily polluted from cooking with dirty fuels. Thousands of children are dying from diabetes because they have not been diagnosed or their families cannot afford insulin. Most of these premature deaths could be avoided. So we must intensify our efforts to prevent them. The NCD crisis poses a huge development challenge as well as an equality challenge. It is the poorest and most vulnerable people who are most at risk. The COVID-19 pandemic has been a wake-up call for governments across the globe. People living with NCDs have a higher risk of developing severe complications and dying from COVID-19. So, dear friends, the pandemic has led to disruption of NCD services, with severe consequences for people suffering from cardiovascular and respiratory diseases, cancer, diabetes, mental health, all of it. So the conclusion is pretty obvious. Investing in stronger health systems, service delivery and prevention of NCDs will make vulnerable populations more resilient to COVID-19 and future pandemics. This is also vital for promoting universal health coverage. NCD prevention and access to treatment and medicine must be a core component in the efforts to enhance pandemic preparedness and response and in building back better in the post-pandemic recovery. This is a priority for my country, Norway, in our work to actively promote global cooperation on pandemic management and health preparedness. The UN member states have all committed to working to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. This includes SDG targets 3.4, which is about reducing premature deaths from NCDs by one-third by 2030. Regrettably, only 14 countries are on track at present. We are still far from reaching that target. So today we are launching the International NCD Compact and we encourage all countries to organi and organizations to participate. This will be a concerted global effort aimed at saving millions of people from dying too young, too young from diseases that could have been prevented or treated. NCDs are a large-scale problem worldwide, but I am convinced that it is possible to win this fight and get it right. 
but we have only eight years to go until the 2030 deadline. So we have no time to lose. Let's get to work and let's achieve these very important and noble goals. Thank you for your attention. And thank you also, Your Excellency, for your statement indeed. Recognizing that only 14 countries are on track with the SDGs and we have only eight years to the end of the Sustainable Development Goals, we encourage countries to double their efforts in the fight against NCDs. Shall we give him another round of applause, please? So we've been made aware by the Honorable Minister for Health that His Excellency, the President of Ghana, is unable to be here today due to other pressing national duties. But he sent us a representative in the person of the Presidential Advisor for Health. Dr. Anthony Insiasari will be giving us the speech on behalf of the President of Ghana. And I would like to invite him up here as we receive his speech. Mama Chairman, Mama Chairman, Ehuna Bobrim, Nana Pra, Ajin Sem, the six, or my hand of Asin or Yurinchi traditional area. Her Excellency, the Prime Minister of Norway, the Prime Minister of Barbados, the Prime Minister of Thailand, and the Prime Minister of Timor Leste. The Director General of World Health Organization, Her Excellencies, Mrs. Rebecca Akufuado, the First Lady of the Republic of Ghana, and Her Excellency Antoinette Sasu Gueso, the First Lady of Congo, Honorable Minister of Health, Honorable Koku Ajmamenu, MP of Doma Central, Honorable Deputy Minister of Health, Members of Parliament, Her Excellency, the Diplomatic Corps, heads of agencies here present, fellow colleagues, health professionals, invited guests, the media, both domestic and foreign who are covering this function, ladies and gentlemen. I'm standing here to give the address of His Excellency, the President, who would have loved to be here this morning but due to exigencies of national duties, he is somewhere else. But luckily, her better, his better half is here with us. And I'm also standing here representing him to read his speech. So all what I'm going to read is from His Excellency, the President. I'm happy to be here this morning to participate in this international strategic dialogue on non-communicable diseases and the sustainable development goals. It is wholly appropriate that we are gathered to address this subject matter at a time when the world is recovering from two years of devastating COVID-19 disease. Not only has the pandemic affected lives and livelihoods and threatened our very existence, but it has also exposed the linkage between non-communicable diseases and severe COVID illness. If there is one thing COVID-19 has succeeded in doing, it is taking the world's attention off other disease burdens that are affecting people and the fabric of our societies. In this, I'm referring to non-communicable disease, otherwise known as the silent killer. Anna Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, Her Excellencies, according to the World Health Organization, non-communicable diseases are responsible for the deaths of some 41 million people each year, representing 71% of all deaths globally. Each year, some 15 million people between the ages of 30 and 69 years 
die from NCD, with 85% of these premature deaths occurring in low and middle income economies. Cardiovascular diseases account for most NCD deaths, that is 17.9 million people annually, followed by cancers, 9.3 million, respiratory diseases, 4.1 million, and diabetes mellitus, 1.5 million. These four groups of diseases account for over 80% of all premature non-communicable disease deaths and share similar risk factors. That is tobacco use, physical inactivity, the harmful use of alcohol and unhealthy diets. It is for this reason that the World Health Assembly came up with a number of resolutions to focus the world's attention and action on tackling the menace. Today's International Strategic Dialogue Meeting is testimony to the relentless and persistence of WHO in tackling the non-communicable diseases. In the same vein, ladies and gentlemen, let me acknowledge the efforts of the Kingdom of Norway and the Republic of Ghana, the two countries whose leaders were appointed in 2017 by the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres as co-chairs of the eminent group of advocates for sustainable development goals, SDGs. Indeed, the office of the president of Ghana, together with the current government of Norway, led by His Excellency Johans, Jonas Gahl Stoltz, and the WHO are organizing this international strategic dialogue policy meeting on NCDs. Let me therefore thank the government of Norway through the NORAD Foundation for choosing Ghana as one of the two beneficiary countries in Africa of the foundation's four-year funding plan to improve prevention and management services for NCDs. Chair, chairperson, Ghana is not so different from any other lower middle income country with respect to the NCDs. Data from the NCD program of the Ghana Health Service indicates that on the average, one out of every five patients who visited the outpatient department was diagnosed with one form of NCD or the other. In fact, 16.7% of OPD attendees in 2017 were diagnosed with NCD, and 19.7% in 2021 of hypertension, diabetes mellitus, road traffic accidents, asthma, stroke, depression, breast cancer, and cervical cancer accounting for most recorded NCDs in the last five years. There has been a lot of country-led initiatives in the past towards reducing the impact of NCDs, which have yielded varied levels of success. If the current burden is anything to go by, it is there obvious that we must augment our collective and individual efforts at reversing the trend, which could threaten our national development. Anna Chairperson, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, it is in this light that the government, through the Ministry of Health and its agencies, in collaboration with ministries, departments, and agencies, and with support from development partners, have revised in relevance to our current contest, the National Non-Communicable Disease Policy, NNCDP 2022, with the accompanying strategy for prevention and control of non-communicable diseases, 2022 to 2026. This policy framework will provide the direction and guidance for all NCD interventions in the country, and is perfectly aligned to the overarching policy framework for health. I'm delighted, therefore, to announce the launch of these two documents together of the Kente WHO NORAD project. I'll do this after the end of this speech. Again, Ghana has revised the essential health service package aligned to life course approach and the different components of health, i.e. promotive, preventive, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative services for a response and highly quality health service delivery for all. Our goal is to ensure that the burden of NCDs 
is reduced to the barest minimum to render it of little or no public health importance and does not become an obstacle to socioeconomic development. We can collectively achieve this laudable goal by one, reducing exposure to risk factors that contribute to NCDs. Two, strengthen early detection and management to reduce morbidity and mortality for NCDs. Three, enhancing the health system for NCD prevention and control. Four, firming up multi-sectorial collaboration for NCD prevention and control. And five, ensuring sustainable funding and other resources for NCD prevention and control. Ghana's fight against NCDs will be concentrated on health promotion, physical inactivity, alcohol use and abuse, tobacco use, diet and nutrition, immunizations, screening and early detection, clinical care, rehabilitation, and palliative care. Special attention will also be given to cancers of all forms, injuries, sickle cell disease, mental health, oral health, and eye health. Already, I'm happy to say, the first lady, Mrs. Rebecca Akufuado, is leading the fight against childhood cancers. The achievement of this national goal calls for deliberate actions on the part of government, the citizenry, civil society organization, the private sector, and friends of Ghana in a coordinated manner. To this end, the health system is being equipped with the requisite client-centered infrastructure in, in logistics. The Agenda 111, which is the biggest health infrastructure investment in the recent memory, therefore comes handy. District hospitals, that is 101 district hospitals with accommodation for doctors, nurses, and other health professionals in the districts without hospitals, there will be also six new regional hospitals for each of the new six new regions recently created. We shall also rehabilitate the Efia Quanta District Hospital, Regional Hospital in the Western Region into a befitting metropolitan hospital for Sekendi Takradi District. One new regional hospital for Western Region will be added, and three psychiatric hospitals for each of the three ecological zones in the country, i.e., the Northern Sector middle sector and the coastal belt. The entire package is estimated at a cost of 1,765 billion United States dollars. This investment, ladies and gentlemen, will help make Ghana a center of medical excellence and a preferred destination for medical tourism in the West Africa sub-region. Additionally, government is also working hard to provide the necessary technologies and assistive systems for convenient access to the delivery of care. We will adopt innovative and sustainable ways of financing health, will strengthen research and evidence generation, and an empowered regulatory mechanism to ensure quality of care for all people living in Ghana. Nana Chairman, Her Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, to ensure a sustainable, impactful fight against the NCDs, there is also the need to activate a coordinated multi-sector engagement for health, both at the government level and at the level of the whole range of actors, health in all policies and whole of government approaches across the sectors and partnership with relevant civil society and private sector entities. I support fully this initiative and I'm eagerly looking forward to the Minister of Health, Honorable Kwaku Ajimamenu, leading this process to its logical conclusion. In federal to this, there is a need to focus attention on innovative ways of raising funds domestically to finance health interventions, including those on NCDs. I appeal to corporate Ghana and other well-meaning Ghanaians to heed to the clarion call of contributing to the health and well-being of all Ghanaians. There is so much we can do collectively than we can do as individuals. To colleagues head of states, I urge them to ensure and endeavor to fail, fulfill the commitments made for the prevention and control of non-communicable diseases. We need to identify new ways to strengthen collaborations in resourcing, knowledge sharing, 
and technical assistance for bolder national NCD response. This response will accelerate the implementation of the commitments made in the UN political declarations of 2011, 2014, and 2018 high-level meetings of the General Assembly in, on the prevention and control of non-communicable diseases. Before I conclude, Nana Chairman, Her Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me congratulate the leadership of the three co-host countries and organizations for coming up with this very important global awakening. I admonish all of us to put our shoulders to the wheel and help reverse the worrying trend of NCDs in our respective countries. This is achievable and the, with the right political commitments, the right systems and structures, development partners support and citizens involvement. In conclusion, therefore, tackling the phenomenon of non-communicable diseases requires the leadership provides visibility to non-communicable disease issue. I ask my colleague heads of states to join hands with me as we establish a, part, a presidential group which is non-binding and as we find solutions to NCDs with the roadmap of universal health coverage and sustainable development goals. In our time, this must be our legacy and I believe we can. May God bless all of you and I thank you for your attention. But Mr. Chairman, before I sit down, I want to take this single, uh, uh, this opportunity to try and launch the, single, uh, the national presidential group and NCD and the compact. So ladies and gentlemen here, excellence, Nana Chairman, I'll take this opportunity to launch the international strategic dialogue of NCDs and the SDGs. Thank you and God bless all of you. Isn't it an exciting moment? Another round of applause, please. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Anthony Nsiasari, the Presidential Advisor for Health, for delivering to us the speech of His Excellency, the President of Ghana, Nana Adodankwa Ekufuado, and also taking the opportunity to launch the NCD Presidential Group as well as the NCD Compact 2020 to 2030. May I inform us all that we'll find copies of the compact in the files we found on our seats. So we all have copies. And it's the document we see rolling just behind me on the days. Thank you once more. So, um, looks like it's been a good day. What do we think? Yes, yes. And it's been a successful events. We've heard statements from heads of state. We have heard from the Director General of the World Health Organization. We have heard statements from Her Excellencies here, the First Ladies of Ghana and Congo. And we've heard statements from a lot of dignitaries. So really, this is a global effort, and it requires our individual and collective actions in tackling NCDs. At this point now, Rolling towards the end of this event, I would like to invite upstage Mr. Chairman Ehuna Bobrim Pra Ajin Sem the sixth to give us his closing remarks. Shall we receive our chairman for today? Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the lesson is no cost, it is an investment. This is a very powerful statement. I remember when we were kids, we had a, a company that provided in the town that I live, 
water supply, electricity, food, and hospital. And when I was a kid, I could not understand why a comp private company should provide all that for those who are working for the company and those who were not working for the company. When I grew up, I realized that the company knew far more than I thought. If the people are healthy, they will produce more for them. If citizens of a country are healthy citizens, the country will be a healthy country. The young lady who spoke here finally said she will wish that mental health problems will be taught at primary school. This is also a very powerful statement. It is powerful because there's one major disease that is killing people in the third world. I guess you, you can't guess, so I'll tell you. It is a disease called stigma. It is killing hundreds, thousands, and millions of people. If you have gone to a sorry fee, meaning a pastor's house, and forgive me, the, the translation may not be as perfect as I would like, but Ghanaians know what a sorry fear means. You can do me the favor of translating properly to your colleagues who are not Ghanaians. If you go there and you see people suffering from mental illness, being chained, both the hands and the legs, and being subjected to good old mosquito bites. They leave their half dead, get into hospital with high fever, and they pronounce arrived dead. And this is pure stigma disease. They were told that their illness is not the type of illness that they should go to hospital with and that it is spiritual. I don't know what that means, whether it's whiskey or brandy or, but they call it spiritual. And so they go to these places and they are subjected to all manner of indecency, no dignity. You go and see them and you will weep. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this non-communicable disease is killing a lot of us prematurely and can be avoided, or perhaps the death delayed. So we shouldn't allow only the medical health workers to take control of this. All of us, all of us to contribute towards managing this disease. The beautiful drama that we saw here, unfortunately, they were talking to the converted. I wish you could see that as part of our education program in our primary schools as suggested by the young lady who came on the screen. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, what is left of me is to thank you for supporting me as a chairperson for today's event. I am very honored to have been appointed or invited to be the chairperson. And I thank all of you once again, especially the Honorable Minister who I know was behind my invitation. I thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, much, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your closing remarks. And thank you also for actually accepting to chair this ceremony and steering it successfully to this end. We received a lot of recorded messages today. I don't know if you believe me if I say we have more, but we won't be taking them. <laughs> I see someone say, thank God. <laughs> but what we will do, because these statements are mostly from heads, um, ministers of health from a lot of countries. So we're going to upload them onto the website. And then in your spare time, please go and watch these videos. Thank you. Now it's time to take our vote of thanks. I would have done that, but no. I'd rather invite a very beautiful woman to give us the vote of thanks. Shall we receive the Honorable Tina Mensa, Deputy Minister for Health? Thank you. Your Excellencies, Nana Chairman. I deem it a great honor to be called upon to deliver the vote of thanks on such an august occasion. First of all, our sincere gratitude goes to Almighty God for granting us this day, making today's event a success. Our sincere thanks goes to the chairman, Nana Hunabu Brimpra Ajinsem the Sith, for steering the affairs of this event. We must mention our deep sense of appreciation to His Excellency Nana Adodankwa Akufuadu, the President and the Commander-in-Chief of Ghana Armed Forces for his support throughout the organization of this event and also for co-hosting this event with the Prime Minister of Norway and the Director General of WHO. We are humbled by the encouraging words from His Excellency the Prime Minister of Norway for his continued support for championing the cause of NCDs especially his support towards the reduction of the burden on NCDs in lower income countries, which is acclaimed globally. Further, we are grateful to the Director General of WHO for his support and leadership in the organization of this groundbreaking event. We take this opportunity to express our sincere appreciation to His Excellency President Maki Sal, Chairperson of A AU and President of Senegal for extending the advocacy on health, especially NCD, to its fellow heads of state. We want to extend our generous thanks to our heads of state for the commitment they have shown by investing resources in the prevention and control of NCDs in your respective countries. Some of, some of you in your short videos to us have pledged to continue working on the NCD agenda. We cannot fail to appreciate our first ladies for their role and involvement in the awareness creation of NCDs. They have done a lot of work in the NCD space already, and we wish to commend them for good work. We are hopeful that the creation of the network for first ladies on NCDs will advance the NCD agenda globally. We would like to thank all health ministers who have blessed us with their presence today, especially our Honorable Minister of Health, Honorable Kuku Menu, for the leadership he provided during the organization of this program. We thank you. <clears throat> Furthermore, we are grateful to the Parliamentary Select Committee on Health, my colleagues, and all members of Ghana Parliament for their priceless contribution towards the health of the population in diverse ways. We are indebted to the WHO and its partners for the support they have given to MOH and the non communicable disease program. We also appreciate representatives from GIZ, PATH, Ghana NCD Alliance, RASH, and other development partners 
donors, as well as institutions and agencies that have identified with us to make this ceremony a success. Our profound gratitude also goes to the diplomatic community for their unflinching support in our efforts at reducing the incidence of NCDs. We also extend our gratitude to the steering committee led by Honorable Minister for Health. They worked hard to put this program together and we are extremely grateful for their tireless efforts in seeing to the successful end of this program. Finally, we will also like to thank all staff of the Ministry of Health and its agencies and staff of the WHO headquarters, Afro and country office who worked behind the scenes to execute this program. Nana Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, once again, we want to state that we are most grateful to all for making this event a success and God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Tina Mensa, for thanking all of us. I would like to also thank you for your role. We have come to the end of our ceremony this morning. And we'll, to end the ceremony this morning, we will take the national anthem from the police band. Shall we kindly all be upstanding? So there'll be a quick photo shoot of the dignitaries in our midst this morning before we all head out for lunch. My name is Angela Akon, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to be your MC today. I wish us all a pleasant afternoon and a safe journey back to wherever our destinations are. And please just to announce that right after the photo shoot, we'll be holding a press conference in the holding room to my left. So we invite all our pressmen here to join colleagues there for the press conference. Thank you.
Tu, tu arrêtes, tu arrêtes, tu arrêtes tout, hein, totalement, comme tu le penses. 